So, we've seen that the most obvious way to decrease the amount of solar radiation coming in, like painting the ground white, maybe isn't that practical and may have strange effects. So what most people think about when they talk about solar radiation modification is not changing the Earth's surface, but changing the Earth's atmosphere. The normal idea is to put tiny particles in the atmosphere and use them to reflect the sunlight away. Now whether this works depends on what altitude the particles are at. At some altitudes it can make things worse by actually trapping the heat. Um, so this is not a simple calculation. You have to do a detailed atmospheric modelling to work out whether more particles at a given height will cool things down or heat things up. But there are two main ideas that are used. One is to inject particles of sulphur dioxide into the stratosphere, or to inject water particles, or make them smaller or bigger, in the lower atmosphere. And we'll talk about these in turn, but before we get on to them, we have to talk a bit about the physics of small particles in the atmosphere, how they stay in the air and how well they intercept light. Now this is an example of the square cube law. Let's imagine you have some particles of different sizes, and they've got some size r, which might be a radius or a diameter or a circumference. It doesn't matter. It's a size. Now, the mass of the particles is proportional to its volume, if we assume they've all got the same density, like they're all water grains, um, in which case volume is proportional to length cubed. So for a sphere, it's uh, 4 pi r cubed. For a cube, it would just be r cubed. But whatever shape it is, it's going to be proportional, the mass, volume and the mass, to r cubed. So that's the mass. But the amount of light it blocks is going to be proportional to its area, its cross-sectional area. An area is going to be proportional to size squared. Whether it's pi r squared or r squared or 4 pi r squared, it's going to be some function of r squared. So what that means is the amount of light reflected per unit mass that's the area of reflection divided by the mass. It's going to be proportional to r squared over r cubed, i.e. 1 over r. So what this is telling us is that small particles do more blocking light than big particles for the same mass. So if you drop the size of a particle from, say, a centimetre to a millimetre, it's ten times smaller. That means each individual particle is going to be a thousand times less massive, so you're going to have a thousand times more particles for the same mass. The amount of light each particle blocks also goes down, but it only goes down a hundred times, r squared. So overall, making the particles ten times smaller means you have ten times more absorption for a given mass. Now you can see this in the weather every day. Sometimes in the air you get big drops of water, this is called rain, and sometimes you get small drops, which is called fog or mist or cloud. And the small drops, a foggy day, there is water in the air, but there's actually less water than when it's raining heavily. But when it's raining heavily you can still see quite a distance, whereas in fog you can't. And the reason is that the small droplets making the fog are very effective at blocking radiation coming through, whereas the big rain droplets are not so effective. So that's an example of the square cube law. Another example of the square cube law is how long particles stay in the air. If you have a particle of air, whether it be a water particle or a dust particle or a sulphur dioxide, whatever it is, its gravity is going to try and pull it down but the air currents might hold it up. Now the gravity is proportional to its mass, so that's proportional to r cubed. Whereas the surface area by which it's pushed around by the air is only proportional to r squared. So once again, when things get small, the effect of the air on them is decreases, but the mass decreases faster, so the ratio of drag force to weight gets higher and higher as things get smaller. What this means is big objects, like me, uh, you drop me, I will fall. But if you shrank me down to a, a millimetre in size, I would fall slower. And if you sh shrunk me down to a micrometre in size, I probably wouldn't even fall at all. The air currents would just push me around. 
So large particles fall out of the sky, and small particles just get pushed around by the air currents, and if they do fall out, it takes a very long time. Now this, it turns out, was of big interest during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. People didn't know how big the droplets were that people breathed out with COVID. So if you had COVID and you went around breathing, or let alone singing or coughing, then droplets would come out of your mouth and your face, and your nose. And the question was, how long would they stay on the air? If the droplets were 10 or 15 or 20 micrometers in size, then they've got enough mass to fall to the surface. And this is what the scientists thought to begin with. They thought that normally these grains would, fall, these droplets would fall to the surface uh, within about one or one and a half meters of where you're sitting. And so that's why they always said social distancing, keep one and a half meters away from anybody else. The idea was that the particles would come out and land on the ground and people would get sick because they would touch the ground and then maybe touch their eyes or their mouth and get the virus that way. But in fact, they were wrong. It turns out that the droplets carrying COVID are much smaller. They're only microns in size. And that means they will stay in the air for a very long time. So someone can breathe it out and it can still be floating around in the room uh, hours later. And that turned out to be the major way in which COVID was spread. And it meant that actually social distancing was not really important. It was far more important to have good ventilation to change the air in their room regularly. A lesson that it took the health people a long time to figure out.